Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Q&A about scalp psoriasis. My name is Bev Bromfield and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You've joined this presentation using your computer speaker system by default. This means if you hear music through your computer, you should be able to hear the presentation. If you prefer to join over the telephone, select Use Telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Although we are highlighting questions received in advance of today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenter by typing into the questions pane on the control panel. We'll collect these and address as many as possible during the Q&A with Dr. Ferris today. Before I provide information about the foundation, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, Amgen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson, and Novartis for their support of today's webinar. Since some of you may be new to the foundation, here's a little background about who we are, our mission, and what we do. For over 50 years, the National Psoriasis Foundation has served more than 8 million individuals in the U.S. living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Founded from a tiny classified newspaper ad in Portland, Oregon, the NPF mission is to drive efforts to cure psoriatic disease and improve the lives of those affected. After completing one of the most ambitious strategic plans in its history, the National Psoriasis Foundation launched a new five-year strategic plan in July 2019. With a continued focus on a life free of psoriatic disease and its burdens, NPF remains committed to finding a cure for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis while supporting individuals to live longer and healthier lives. Over the next five years, NPF will focus on achieving three goals, lead collaborative transformational research in psoriatic disease, increase the lifespan and health of individuals living with psoriatic disease, secure the human, technological, and financial resources necessary to achieve NPF's mission-related goals. By attending today's program, you've already taken a step towards expanding your knowledge about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, moving towards a better understanding of what it means to live with psoriatic disease. A few of the many ways that NPF supports the goal of leading collaborative transformational research includes, today NPF has funded over 28 million in grants and fellowships. That includes almost 3 million in grant fellowship funding announced July 2nd. NPF grant mechanisms support all stages of research and careers. Our efforts focus on areas of unmet need and are often conducted in partnership with research stakeholders with whom we collaborate. In addition to funding outside grants and fellowships, the NPF also leads research initiatives such as the Psoriasis Prevention Initiative and the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant, which are new to the foundation. The Psoriasis Prevention Initiative was developed at the recommendation of the Psoriasis Prevention Initiative Steering Committee, who urged a definition of prevention to better guide the proposal development, and that's how it expanded to include disease relapse and comorbidities. NPF plans to invest $6.5 million over five years in this effort. The second initiative is the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant, which aims to develop a diagnostic test for psoriatic arthritis. This could significantly reduce the time between onset of symptoms and a diagnosis. This is important because we know as little as six months of delay between onset of symptoms of psoriasis and start of treatment can lead to permanent joint damage. This slide highlights four NPF research efforts that you can be part of. Launched in 2015, the NPF Corona National Psoriasis Patient Registry is the largest independent observational registry of psoriasis patients in the United States. The registry collects and studies patient health information, allowing researchers to compare the safety and effectiveness of psoriasis treatments, better understand conditions that are related to psoriasis, and explore the history of the disease. There are currently more than 12,700 patients enrolled at more than 270 sites across the country. Your dermatologist may be enrolled as an NPF Corona National Psoriasis Patient Registry site. Not sure if they are? Ask. If they're not, encourage them to join. The LIGHT study is a real-world research study that compares the effectiveness of home versus office-based UVB phototherapy treatment of psoriasis. Entry criteria for the study are simple. You must be age 12 or older, have plaque or good tape psoriasis, and be a candidate for office or home phototherapy. There is no washout of topical, oral, or biologic medications, and the study is designed to be easily incorporated into routine patient care. 
It is also unique because it includes equal representation of all skin phototypes. Citizen Scientist is a platform where you as a patient answer survey questions which you and researchers can analyze for trends and new insight. Citizen Scientist is currently being revitalized for greater community benefit. The NPF Annual Survey is a data collection effort the Foundation has conducted for two decades. This important research conducted each fall provides insight into the lived experience of individuals with psoriasis, including quality of life and unmet needs. If you are contacted about this annual survey, we would appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. To achieve the Foundation's goals as mentioned, please support our mission through donations or by participating in virtual or live team NPF events, such as Stamp Out Psoriasis Walk or Cycle event. You can learn more at psoriasis.org forward slash donate or teamnpf.org. On behalf of the National Psoriasis Foundation, thank you for attending today's webinar and for submitting questions in advance. We received a lot of questions for today's webinar, which is truly for you since your questions form the basis of what Dr. Ferris will discuss today. Today's questions will be broken out by categories, which Dr. Ferris will mention shortly. If submitting questions today, please type in your questions based on the announced topic. We'll try to address as many questions as possible in the time allowed. And I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, dermatologist Dr. Laura Ferris. Dr. Ferris is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh Department of Dermatology and Clinical and Translational Science Institute, where she practices general medical dermatology with a special focus on skin cancer and psoriasis. Dr. Ferris is also the Director of Clinical Trials at the UPMC Department of Dermatology, where she has served as a principal investigator on more than 30 clinical trials in dermatology primarily in the area of psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, melanoma, and skin cancer. Dr. Ferris has been an invited speaker at several national and international meetings and has published more than 60 book chapters and articles in peer-reviewed literature. She is also a professional member of the National Psoriasis Foundation, a member of the American Academy of Dermatology, and a member of the Corona National Psoriasis Registry, which I just mentioned earlier. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Laura Ferris, who will present today's Q&A about scalp psoriasis webinar. Please welcome Dr. Ferris. Thank you so much, um, Bevan. It's, it's really uh, great to be here and to be able to answer some of the questions. A really important topic, as evidenced by the number of questions that came in, and this is obviously a, a, something of great interest to patients with psoriasis. I did want to put out some disclosures, as was mentioned. I do a lot of work in psoriasis, and so I have worked as a consultant uh, with several companies, as listed here, and then also I have research grant funding from several companies primarily focused on psoriasis as well. So we have organized your uh, questions into some categories that we'll go through. So those categories will start with symptoms, uh, next move on to hair loss, Next, we'll talk about treatments, uh, first focusing on topical treatments, and then we'll also talk about some other treatments, and then we'll move on to natural treatments. So we'll start with symptoms. So a lot of the questions that came in were about the, the symptoms, and the two main ones are really itching and flaking. So what can I do to stop itching and flaking. A lot of it comes down to treating the psoriasis and treating the underlying disease. So there's kind of symptomatic treating and then there's treatment of the psoriasis itself. First of all, we'll talk about topical therapy. One of the major topical therapies that we use are topical steroids. So we do have to use kind of higher strength topical steroids to get psoriasis better. So these are your high potency steroids, things that you might see like augmented beta methasone or clobetazole. Those can help the underlying disease, but they also really do help with itching. So topical steroids are anti-inflammatory. So when patients say, I'm just so itchy, what's the first thing I can do? I usually say, put on your topical steroid. That also will help with the flaking because you're going to decrease the inflammation in the scalp, you're going to decrease the production of flakes. In terms of treatments other than steroids that specifically address the flaking, when you have psoriasis, the skin cells are turning over too quickly. 
and they reach the surface of the skin too quickly. So there's just too many of them there. So the, the flaking is really dead skin cells that are sitting and not able to be shed fast enough. So we can do some things to help with that. We usually use things that we call keratolytic. So keratin is the protein that's in the skin cells, chemicals that can break that down. One of the main ones that we use is salicylic acid. And so salicylic acid is an ingredient in a lot of over-the-counter products. So if you look at shampoos, which we'll talk about, a lot of times you want to look for a psoriasis shampoo that contains salicylic acid. That can help to break down flaking. The next question about symptoms is what relief options are available when scalp psoriasis moves into behind the ears? And it's, they're really the same treatments for the ears. I, I think that really the most effective treatment there are topical steroids. When you have psoriasis right behind the ear, I'll generally use sort of, or within the ear, a sort of mid-potency topical steroid. So that's something like triamcinolone, for example. So with that, you can use a cream or an ointment. You know, as, as everybody with psoriasis knows, the vehicle that your medicine is in is really important. So an ointment can be soothing. It tends to be greasier. That can be fine on the skin. Sometimes it's oftentimes something that patients don't like to put on their scalp because they feel like it leaves their hair greasy. Although for some patients, if their hair is very dry and their scalp feels dry, they don't mind. Or if you normally would use oil as part of your hair styling, that, that can be okay too. So I generally recommend doing either creams or ointments of steroids when psoriasis is behind or even in the ear. Something that often comes up is, is it safe to put steroids in my ear? We do use sometimes steroid eardrops for a number of conditions. So yes, it is safe. I tell patients to just put some on a cotton swab and then to just gently apply it in the ear. You don't want to, like anything, you don't want to ram that cotton swab down and far into the ear canal, but using it to sort of gently spread steroid around. And I think one of the more important messages I try to get across is it's okay to put that in your ear. Psoriasis inside the ear can be incredibly itchy and flaky. You do need to treat that. And so topical steroids are fine to do in there. The other thing I would say is sometimes if you have a lot of psoriasis in your ear, Patients will sometimes say, I feel like I'm losing my hearing. And what happens is that just like you collect scale from the scalp or scale from your skin lesions, scale comes off the psoriasis inside the ear. And that can actually kind of plug up and, and block. It's like having an ear plug in. So sometimes going to an ear, nose, and throat doctor who can clean out the ear canal, much like they do if you accumulate too much earwax, that can really help if you're experiencing hearing loss. What do you do if you've used the medicine for two weeks and your scalp psoriasis hasn't gone away? So I think this is a really important question. Everybody has a little different formula. So some doctors may say, use them two weeks on and then two weeks off. Well, sometimes patients will say, well, but everything started to really get better by the end of that two weeks, but it wasn't gone. And then I stopped. And then by the time my two week break was up, everything had come back. So that doesn't seem like a great option. So one, I, I don't think that you need to take a full two week break. I actually tell patients use this for five days and then take a two day break and then go back to five days. So sometimes we just need a little more continuous use. So that's kind of one answer to that. The other answer is if you keep using a medicine and you may want to give it more than two weeks, but if you've given it two months, let's say, and you're scalps, your psoriasis on the scalp or anywhere hasn't gotten significantly better, it may be time to think about a different treatment plan. Maybe that means adding another medication. Maybe it needs switching medications. So I think the take-home points for that are you don't necessarily have to stop completely after two weeks. And don't be afraid to ask your doctor, can we add something else or can we do something differently? Because I've given this a lot of time and it's still there. Uh, what triggers psoriasis to appear at age 59 when one has not had it uh, previously? So it's interesting. There's sort of two peaks when we see psoriasis occur. So psoriasis can occur at any time. We see it occur in infancy. We see it occur in people in their 70s or 80s. But there's kind of two main 
time periods where we see a peak of psoriasis. So one is in the late teens, early 20s, and then the other is sort of in this mid to late 50s, early 60s age point. So one, that's just the way that the disease happens. Um, we don't completely understand why. We know certainly know that people are in some ways genetically predisposed to get psoriasis. We do know that there's some risk factors associated with developing psoriasis. So one of those can be obesity or being overweight. And that, as you age, we, we all, many of us have the experience of realizing that our weight tends to go up as we age. So as we start to hit our 50s and 60s, some people will cross into the kind of medical definition of being overweight or even obese. And that's a risk factor for developing psoriasis. So healthy lifestyle, is really important, particularly if you talk to your loved ones who maybe are genetically related to you, don't have psoriasis, encouraging them to work with you on a healthy lifestyle to help prevent it is important too. Will psoriasis on the head ever go away or will it just be ongoing? So psoriasis, scalp psoriasis, it can be something that will persist. We really work in, as dermatologists to try to adequately treat this disease. So if you have it, if the first treatment doesn't work, we move on to the second one or we add something else and we talk with you about what's the best therapy for you. So I, can psoriasis, scalp psoriasis go away? Absolutely, with good treatment. I have that happen with my patients all the time. If they stop the treatment, it does often come back. But I think that we do have some good treatments and I wouldn't give up hope that you can get rid of scalp psoriasis with good treatment. This was, I think, a really important question. Should someone get the COVID-19 vaccine when they have a flare-up on the scalp? So I want to address this, really not just related to scalp psoriasis, but for psoriasis patients in general. So a great, I think, miracle of medicine of the past year has been that we've had a, a pandemic like nothing any of us in our life have ever seen, and that through science and research, we were able to come up with really effective vaccines that have the potential to put an end to this pandemic. So I know I went out and got mine the minute I was eligible. In fact, I even got it. I went into a clinical trial to be one of the first people to get the vaccine. So I'm a 100% big believer that this is a really important thing for our health. I thought it was important for mine. I also felt like it was important for the health of my psoriasis patients who I see every day. So question is one, I get asked a lot, well, I have psoriasis. If I already have a, 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 an inflammatory disease, is it dangerous for me to get the COVID vaccine? Or now I'm getting the question, is it dangerous for me to get the COVID booster? And really the answer is no. There have been several published studies now looking at what happens to patients who have inflammatory disease like psoriasis, or psoriatic arthritis or maybe rheumatoid arthritis. And the, the data really show that getting the vaccine is not associated with the high risk of having your disease flare up or get worse. As you know, with psoriasis, there are periods where your disease is going to flare. All that well before COVID existed, if the disease does tend to get better and worse sometimes. We do know that we don't have any evidence to suggest that the vaccine has a high risk of making people flare. Have there been some reports? They have, but it's always been disease that even that flare could be contained. Scalp psoriasis doesn't put anybody at any greater risk. And so if you are somebody who is eligible for the booster shot, at this point, we are certainly not telling people that psoriasis should get in the way of that at all. Next question. I have scalp psoriasis and acne in the middle of my head and in the ear. What can I use to get rid of psoriasis and acne? Obviously, two different conditions, psoriasis and acne. And I think a couple important points with this. One, topical steroids are great for treating psoriasis on the skin, but they have side effects. And one of those side effects is acne. So be careful that you're, if you have scalp psoriasis and you're using, let's say, a steroid solution, make sure that you're washing your skin on your forehead or on your face after you've applied that. Because if that steroid is dripping down and sitting on your skin, it may actually be causing the acne. And then the other thing that I would say is the one drug that we have that really works against both is salicylic acid again. So there are 
face washes. If you look just at the drugstore at acne face washes, look for one that has salicylic acid in it. So that can help with the acne, and it can also help with the psoriasis that you might be getting on your face. So I, I think that's the one take home point that that's the drug that works for both. Okay, next questions were about hair loss. So I'm gonna sort of lump these questions together a little bit. Does psoriasis cause hair loss or thinning? What's the prevalence or how often does that happen? Can it prevent hair growth? And you know, most importantly, what can I do to help my hair regrow if I have had some fallout? So psoriasis can be associated with hair loss sort of through a few different pathways. So one is just having that constant ongoing inflammation on the scalp can interfere with hair growth or it can increase hair shedding. So sometimes we do see that patients have sort of some thinning of the hair. And when they have that and it's, it's sort of all over the scalp, I generally say, you know, the first thing we need to do is address your psoriasis. And if we can get that psoriasis under control, decrease the inflammation, that's going to really take care of the hair shedding problem. So again, if you're noticing hair shedding or your hair is thinning, make sure you tell your doctor. You know, a lot of times you don't, sometimes patients come in and say, I've lost a bunch of hair. And I look at them and think, boy, I'd love to have that head of hair. But you know, we don't always know what, what your baseline is or where you started. So I've seen patients and they bring me a picture of what they looked like. And while their hair is thicker than mine has ever been, it's definitely a change for them. So make sure you communicate that with your doctor. And then talk about wanting to address your scalp psoriasis in part to help to deal with the hair loss. So that's one thing. Another thing is that there is a condition called alopecia areata. So that's a condition in, in where you can lose hair. And generally you lose that in kind of big patches or circular areas. So we know that in a study looking at patients with alopecia areata, this is getting at that prevalence question, about 2% of those patients had psoriasis. And that was higher than their, the, the general population that they were looking at. So we do think that patients who have psoriasis are a little bit more likely to develop alopecia areata. So the key to that is, am I getting circles of hair loss? So maybe most of your hair is normal, but you have big patches where it's discreetly lost. Important, again, to bring that up to your doctor. And then the other thing I would bring up is that while it's a rare side effect, the drugs, the biologic drugs that we call TNF inhibitors, these are things like adalimumab or Humira or Etanercept or Enbrel or Infliximab or Remicade. They have been associated very rarely with patients developing patches of alopecia or hair loss with psoriasis in them. So usually we see that a little bit more if a patient is taking that drug for another indication like inflammatory bowel disease. But if you're on one of those drugs and you start to, to develop these patches of hair loss, ask your doctor about it because there's sometimes a chance that it could be associated. Now, what do we do about it? So number one, we address the underlying psoriasis. We do a careful exam of your scalp. If we think you have alopecia areata, we'll talk about treatments for that. One of the treatments, usually the first thing that we'll do is actually give you an injection right into the scalp of steroid. And so that can actually help the scalp psoriasis and it can help the alopecia areata if we think that's what you have. Okay, we'll start with uh, topical treatments and the questions that came in there. So this was a really common question. What's the best shampoo and conditioner to use for scalp psoriasis? There are non-prescription and prescription ones. So let's talk about non-prescription because these are things you can go into the drugstore and buy. There's really a couple main or a few main ingredients that we look for. So one is salicylic acid that we mentioned. So sometimes you'll see a psoriasis shampoo or a dandruff shampoo. Turn around the back of the bottle and look at the ingredients. So salicylic acid can be in those. Just to give you, I have no conflicts of interest, one that is easy to find and easy to locate in the drugstore. Sometimes Neutrogena makes one called T-Sal, that's salicylic acid. So a lot of times I'll tell my patients, look for that one. And, and the other ingredient can be uh, coal tar. 
So these are shampoos that will tend to be more kind of dark brown in color. Again, the Neutrogena one that is usually sitting next to T-Sal is T-Gel. So that's tar. That can be, that's a good anti-inflammatory. That's something that we use. Another shampoo ingredient that we look for sometimes is selenium sulfide. That's, I think it's a little harder to find sometimes, but selenium sulfide, sometimes that's in sort of the bluish, the old Selsun blue shampoo had selenium sulfide in it. That's anti-inflammatory. That can be helpful. And then the other thing is zinc pyrethione. So zinc pyrethione is also found in dandruff shampoos. So I think that those are all helpful in psoriasis. We talked about salicylic acid and scale. So salicylic acid, if you've got really thick scale on your scalp, I really think adding a salicylic acid shampoo can be very um, helpful. So it helps in two ways. One, it'll just help break down that scale. Two, when you break down that scale, it actually lets the other medications that you might be putting on penetrate better. So I do recommend that for patients, particularly with thicker scale in their scalp. A couple other important points about um, shampoos. Sometimes these shampoos that are out there for psoriasis aren't maybe the most cosmetically elegant or fanciest shampoos. They're not what you'd walk in and buy from a salon. And I tell my patients, you know, that's okay. I don't really need the shampoo to treat your hair. I just need the shampoo to treat your scalp. So if you've got the time and you still wanna use your shampoo, I say, take your medicated shampoo, put it on and really rub it. And this maybe applies more to women because we've got more hair to deal with oftentimes, but not always. So take your shampoo, rub it into your scalp. Don't worry about getting it on every end of your hair. Just rub that medicated shampoo into your scalp and let it sit for five minutes. And then you can rinse that out. And then if you want to follow that with your nicer shampoo that you used to actually watch to focus on the hair, rather than the scalp. Ditto for conditioner. I don't really recommend medicated conditioners. Most of the medicated hair products really are shampoos. So you can follow this with your conditioner. And I think that that works well. It sometimes lets you use the shampoo you've always liked to use on your hair, but still get the medicated aspect too. In terms of prescription shampoos, there are shampoos that contain steroid, usually clobetazole, so that can be used on the scalp. So it's a way to get contact with the scalp. So you can apply that, you know, rub it into your scalp, and then let it sit for a few minutes and wash it away. I, to be honest, tend to use those a little bit less. If I'm going to use steroid on the scalp, I like something that I can, that patients put on and it stays on. I also don't like the idea of a steroid washing down over your back, over your face, maybe around your eyes. And the reason for that is what we had talked about before, acne. So I generally try to say, if we're going to use a steroid, let's do something that's left on. So this is about questions about, will my hair color make my scalp psoriasis worse? Or are there hair products that I should avoid? So I tell patients with psoriasis, it's fine to get your hair colored. Some hair colors are irritating or some patients happen to be allergic to them. Certainly if you're having issues with that, maybe try to find another hair coloring option. You don't want something that makes your scalp actually hurt after. Also, sometimes scalp will retain a little bit of the hair color, so just be aware of that. The other thing I would say is if you're spending time and money to color your hair, particularly a light like blonde color, be aware that tar-based shampoos can actually stain the hair. So you might want to, if you're a platinum blonde, you might want to avoid tar-based shampoos. Other hair care products, really not much that I would say needs to be avoided. How often can you use Taclinex liquid without getting thinning of your scalp skin? So I'm going to kind of generalize that to all topical steroids. So one of the side effects of topical steroids can be thinning of the skin or stretch marks. That definitely tends to be more of an issue when you're using it on your body. It's not as much of an issue on the scalp just because the scalp is so thick. The other thing I tell patients is, you know, when we use steroids on psoriasis, we actually want the thinning of the skin. I want that, that epidermis or top layer of skin to thin out a little bit. So I worry about this a lot less with psoriasis than, for example, my patients with eczema. So we do still like breaks. And this is why I usually tell patients, once we have you stabilized, I really want you to do five days on, 
two days off. And if that keeps you clear, try to wait, work your way back. Maybe you go to three days on and then the rest of the week off. So everybody's a little different. Individualize your therapy to what works for you. But if you're taking at least that two day break and you're only using the steroid when you have active disease and not using it on the days that you're clear, I don't worry too much about that. I wear a hijab and live in a hot country. How do I take care of my scalp without using oily products on my scalp? That's a great question. I think that in that case, this is a time when shampoos can be really helpful. So if you're in a really hot country, you're probably having to wash your hair more frequently. Make use of each shower each time you're putting something on your scalp and use the medicated shampoos. The other things that you can do are, we talk about vehicles and medications, so a liquid. So there are sort of two liquid formulations for topical steroids. One is an oil-based. So they're a peanut oil based. I think that's great sometimes. The oil can help lift scale off, but it does leave an oily residue that has to be washed out of the hair. So if you want something to lift off scale, by all means do the oil. If you're looking for a way to not have so much oil, a solution is a good way to go. So solutions can be in a dropper bottle or they can be in a spray bottle. Sometimes a spray is nice. You can lift up sections of hair, spray right onto the scalp. And I think that that's a great option for patients too. So higher potency steroid made into a liquid or into a spray. I know sometimes I have my pharmacy compound or mixed together a high potency steroid like clobetazole together with some salicylic acid and then together with some zinc pyrethium. So that combination has been great for some of my patients. It gets, they put it into a spray bottle. They can spray it right onto the scalp. They can even use it on some areas like elbows and knees as well. So those are kind of the main things in topicals. I just did want to add, I mentioned briefly oils. So there are oils that contain steroid. So that can be a great option. They're usually the one that's available in the U.S. is peanut oil based. So make sure if you have a peanut oil that you mention that peanut allergy, mention that to your doctor. And then there is actually an oil you can buy over the counter. You can buy sort of a mineral oil preparation that has something called phenol in it. It's called P, like the letter P and S, the letter S solution. You can buy that over the counter. It's oil based and that can really help lift scale off too. Dr. Ferris, we had a question come in tonight asking, can you use shampoos for scalp psoriasis on a daily basis? You can. So if you're somebody who normally washes your hair every day, then it's okay to do that uh, on a daily basis. If you find it's drying you out too much, by all means, take a break. It is safe to do these every day. The other thing I would say is that if patients are washing their hair every day, I'll tell them, you know, pick two different shampoos. Pick maybe one that has tar and one that has salicylic acid and switch off between those. Then you're getting sort of different treatments uh, when, you're, when you're washing. And I think that helps. I guess the only one other thing that I meant to mention under topicals is we talked about vehicles and we talked a lot about liquids. We talked about shampoos. We talked about sprays. The other thing I wanted to mention are foams. So just like hair mousse, there are sort of hair mousse preparations that contain steroids, like for example, clobetazole. So you can ask your doctor about getting a mousse that contains steroid. And I think that, that that works for some people. And then the other thing, of course, is some of these considerations are different if you have a lot of hair on your scalp or a little hair. If you have very little hair, creams can be just fine. Just rub the cream on. If it's not getting caught in two feet of hair, it's for a lot of my uh, male patients who have really short hair, men who have lost most of their hair. Creams are great and easy to use, and that's totally fine to do too. The other vehicle that I think sometimes we underutilize are gels. So gels are alcohol-based, but they dry. They don't leave a residue like a cream or an ointment does. So sometimes if the idea of putting a gel on your scalp doesn't sound too bad, you can get clobetazole, for example, in a gel. So I just wanted to mention that too. Okay, other treatments. 
So what medications can you use to reduce the flakes and patches on the scalp? I think we really talked about that. That is in topically, it's things like your topical steroid solutions, your shampoos. The other thing, and we, there's a question down lower about scalp psoriasis and biologics, but certainly the same medications that we use to treat psoriasis of the skin can be used to treat psoriasis of the scalp. So if topicals aren't doing it for you, make sure you tell your doctor because we'll use oral medications like mefetrexate or like acetretin or psoriatine or a premolast or otesla or any of the biologics can be used. So scalp psoriasis really impairs people's quality of life. It doesn't matter that maybe it's three handprints. If it's thick and red and flaking all over your clothes, that's an important impact on your quality of life. And uh, just because it's only the scalp, I never see that as a reason not to move on to more effective therapies. How effective is phototherapy in treating plaque psoriasis? So on the body, plaque psoriasis, I think phototherapy can be quite good in the right patient. For the scalp, which I know we're focusing on, it's okay. Problem is, of course, many of our scalps are covered with hair. And so reaching, having the light reach there can be tough. In our last slide, we saw a picture, which was sort of a light comb. You can actually get light combs. You can buy them kind of anywhere on the internet. There are companies that really specialize in phototherapy for skin disease. So there's like, for example, the company National Biologics, if you look on their website, they have a light comb and it just looks like a comb, but all the comb teeth are have light in them. So when you brush through, you can actually get that light to the scalp. So I, I think that that, if you're gonna try light, is a great option. You can also do things like laser treatment. So eczema laser, can be done. It has to be done in a dermatologist's office, but it can be done on the scalp. And the person operating the laser will part the hair and try to get directly on the scalp so you can bypass the hair. Both of my teenage daughters have scalp psoriasis. What's safe for them to use on their scalp? So obviously as parents, we think about the safety of medications for our kids often more than we think about it for ourselves. And so one, it's important to have good pediatric studies that we know medications are safe in kids. So um, we do know that st topical steroids have been extensively studied in children. Overuse over wide areas of the body can be a problem. Just being used on the scalp, even the strongest steroids like probatazole, I'm very comfortable giving to kids because the area, what we worry about is how much gets absorbed. So shampoo is definitely fine on teenagers and then the topical steroids. And then the question was about biologics and its new advances. So one, I would say we actually have pretty reasonable data on all the biologics that they do help scalp psoriasis. So we have most of the clinical trials that we do looking at biologics now. We do assessments to kind of quantify how much of the body improved. We also do the same thing for the scalp. So we have data for pretty much all the biologics saying, yes, they do improve scalp psoriasis. In terms of dedicated studies, there's two that have been performed where they really specifically said the primary endpoint or the main thing we're looking for is how well did this work on scalp psoriasis? And so that was for Apremolast, which is Otesla of Hill, and then Secukinumab, which is Cosentix. And both show good efficacy in helping the scalp, but we do see that with other biologics and other oral medicines too natural treatments. So this is always a tough question. As a, a scientist and a physician, I really like well-designed, thought out ahead of time, randomized, placebo-controlled trials, because that's what gives us the best data to say, yes, this actually works. It wasn't that you were in the office more or that it was the vehicle or the, the foam that the medicine was contained in. So I really love those. We don't necessarily have that kind of data for natural treatments, but people are interested in this. And I will mention that. So natural treatments, I try to look for the things that have the most data. So there was a study of a, a supplement called curcumin. So it's sort of an herbal therapy and you can buy this over the counter and curcumin supplementation has been associated with improvements in psoriasis. So there's the, the one that was studied is called Mariva and two grams a day was the dose that was used. And that did seem to have an impact on psoriasis severity. So if you want something that's very natural, I think that that's something that can be done. Oils, even just plain old mineral oil can help to lift the scale off. So we have 
oils that contain steroids, but plain old oil that can be used. And then triggers, so things like food, environment. People ask about diet and psoriasis a lot. We have some information. It's really hard to do diet studies, but I will say there's kind of some anecdotal evidence that very healthy diets, things like green, a lot of green leafy vegetables probably do help in psoriasis. And it's hard to know, are they helping? The other things that work are weight loss. So if patients are put on a good, healthy, low calorie diet and they lose weight, their psoriasis tends to get better. So it's hard to say, are are these patients getting better on a green leafy diet because of the actual vegetables or just because of sort of the healthy nature of that diet that it's helping keep their weight under control. There's also been some talk about gluten is one that comes up a lot. There's some data on gluten and psoriasis. So there's probably a small segment of patients with psoriasis who have gluten sensitivity that may not have been diagnosed. And studies have shown that those patients, if they go on a gluten-free diet, their psoriasis can improve but that's really not going to be the case for most patients. So I tell patients healthy diet and keeping a healthy weight through exercise are probably the best dietary changes that you can make. And then coconut oil. You know, I think that coconut oil can help scalp psoriasis. I really do think it's the oil component of it. I don't know if there's anything particularly magical about the coconut, but that the oil component does help to lift the scale um, off of the scalp. I think that kind of went through my questions, Bev. I don't know if there's any other questions that came in that you wanted that we didn't already address. We do have a few. One question asked, does washing hair more or less make a difference? So that's a great question. So scalp psoriasis sort of exists on a spectrum with something that we call seborrheic dermatitis. So seborrhea or seborrheic dermatitis tends to be more pink. It, and flaky, it definitely can affect the scalp. It loves to affect the ears, the creases around the nose, the middle of the chest where sometimes you can grow hair on your chest, that area, and then even sometimes like under the armpit. So and it tends to have a scale on it that's a little, almost has more of a greasy feel to it. Like it almost feel, it's not quite the same flakes that you see with psoriasis. So if you have seborrhea, I really more frequent hair washing can be, can be really helpful with that. So sometimes patients will come in with pretty bad seborrhea and say, I've been trying everything. I, I tried to stop only washing my hair once every week or once every two weeks because my scalp's so dried out, look how flaky it is. And I have to say, actually, sort of the opposite. Seborrhea is driven by yeast, that, like natural yeast that live on our skin that will overgrow. And so one of the ways to address that is simply by more frequent hair washing. So in general, I actually tell people, if you're going to do anything with your frequency of hair washing, go up, wash more frequently. And another question, will not treating scalp psoriasis impact other functions in the body? So I think that's an important question. One of the big questions, and I think something that the NPF has been super helpful with funding research into is we always say psoriasis, it's not just skin deep. So we talk about how patients with psoriasis are at risk of heart disease. They have a little higher risk of cancer overall, not because of the therapies, but just based on the chronic inflammation that's happening in their body. And so the natural next question is, well, what if I treat it? If I treat my psoriasis, does my risk of heart disease or does my risk of cancer go down? And that's really still an open question. We do tend to say, if you've got a lot of inflammation in your scalp or any or all over your body from psoriasis, we do think that that probably has detrimental effects. I can't show you a study and say, and we have proven that when we give you treatment and your psoriasis gets better, that your risk of cancer or heart disease goes down. But we do have some little pieces of evidence using a few different drugs that treating psoriasis may reduce the risk of particularly heart disease. So I do encourage patients, if do you need to stress over every little flake? No, but are you probably doing yourself some good overall to reduce your burden of psoriasis? I do think you are. And another question received tonight, wearing a bonnet overnight, will that help with the absorption? 
So yeah, wearing a hair wrap or those old uh, shower cap things that you get in a motel that's plastic with the elastic around it. I think that, uh, yes, those can help in a few ways. One, I tell my patients when they use a scalp oil, put on the shower cap. So one, most people, they're more likely to use it if they don't wake up to a big oil stain on their pillowcase in the morning. Two, we do know that being under occlusion or having coverage, which sort of traps the body warmth, actually lets steroids penetrate better. So I do think that wearing something over the head does overnight does help. Great, thank you. And one last question, are biologics safe during COVID if you have comorbidities? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that's something we've been trying to answer. So, and really what we found is that the answer is yes, they are safe. So there was a recent study that came out and they looked at two questions. One, they really looked for the study at the TNF inhibitors because they're the most commonly used worldwide for psoriasis. So things like adalimumab, Humira. And they looked at one, were psoriasis patients on those drugs more likely to get COVID than patients who were on other medications? And the answer was no, they were not more likely to get it. And then they asked, what about the patients who do get it? Are they more likely to get hospitalized as sort of our the, the end point or marker for having really bad COVID? And not only were they not more likely to, interestingly, patients on TNF inhibitors were less likely to be hospitalized. So we really do feel like these drugs are still safe. We have some data looking at vaccine responses and the biologics we use for psoriasis by and large, the patients who were on those drugs and got vaccinated still mounted good detectable immune responses against COVID. So we are highly recommending, one, continue to adequately treat your psoriasis through COVID, and two, get vaccinated no matter what your treatment and when it's time for boosters. And we get clear recommendations on that, which I know the NPF is furiously working on getting out to everybody. Follow the guidance and get your booster too. Okay, great. And then a point of clarification, can you spell out the name of the product that you mentioned earlier that's zinc based? So yeah, so zinc, so Z-I-N-C, and then pyrethione, P-Y-R-E, T-H-I-O-N-E. Okay, thank you. That was a request. And lots of over-the-counter formulations. Thank you, Dr. Ferris, for taking time to be with us today. You had a lot of great tips that I'm sure our attendees found very helpful about how to treat their scalp psoriasis. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And given the questions that we received about COVID, if you have additional questions about COVID-19, please refer to the COVID-19 Resource Center where updates can be found for the guidance statements, which are now also available in Spanish. Look for updates from the COVID-19 task force to the guidance statements, such as the need for boosters, once available data has been assessed, along with an upcoming town hall discussion. In addition to today's webinar, you can continue to learn about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis through NPS podcast series, Soundbites, which is available through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Ghana, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, or a feed service of your choice. You can also access podcasts at the website listed here. If you'd like to hear more about types of psoriasis and sites, listen to episode 134. Let's talk hard to treat psoriasis with dermatologist Dr. Robert Kalb. Join rheumatologist and dermatologist Dr. Joseph Marola and MPF's chief scientific and medical officer Dr. Stacy Bell as they bust myths about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis in episode 120. August is Psoriasis Action Month. During August, receive the latest information about managing psoriasis and treatment options via email through the advanced e-news. If you're not receiving the e-news, subscribe today at psoriasis.org. Connect with others on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to engage in our Q&A series about the types of psoriasis. To order your Psoriasis Action Month kit about types of psoriasis, contact the Patient Navigation Center, the world's first personalized support center for people impacted by psoriatic disease. If you still have questions, would like additional information about treatment options, need help finding a physician, or having issues with accessing treatment. Contact our Patient Navigation Center by phone or email as indicated on the screen. You can also contact the Navigation Center to ask about connecting with others through the 1-1 program. Reach out at education at psoriasis.org or call 1-800-723-9166, option 1.
Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey to provide feedback about the presentation. Tell us what you think. We value and appreciate your comments. Thank you again to our sponsors, Amgen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson, and Novartis for their support of today's webinar. And finally, you can watch this webinar along with other presentations in our webcast archive, also at psoriasis.org forward slash watch hyphen and hyphen listen. This concludes our presentation for today. Thank you for attending.